Hello everyone and welcome back to part two of our morning session for our Vicwater annual conference. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Jo Lim. I'm the Operations and Strategic Projects Manager at Vicwater and I will be moderating this next session through to the lunch break. For anyone who has just joined us at and wasn't able to attend the first session, I'll just run through some very quick housekeeping. Um, we're using Webinar Jam today to get the best possible connection. It's a good idea to close down any other windows that you have running, any other applications that you might have running on your computer. Um, if you do have problems with your connection, there is a refresh button at the top of your screen um, or a reconnection button, I think. And if you click on that, that might um, help overcome some technical issues. Um, if you continue to have problems, can you please uh, just put it in the chat and our admin will try and sort that out for you. Um, there'll be uh, three presentations in this uh, session this morning um, and we will be having Q&A at the end of each session. So please, while the presenters are going through their presentation, feel free to um, ask any questions in the chat and we will be able to follow that and pick that up at the end of each presentation. Every session today is being recorded and a link will be provided to all registered delegates to watch replay available from next week. Okay, it is now my pleasure to introduce our first presenter for this session. Uh, one of the benefits, of course, of having a virtual conference is that we are able to welcome international guests with us uh, much more easily than we could in a, in a physical conference. Um, and our speaker this morning is coming to us from Phoenix, Arizona. I'd like to introduce Dr. Mikhail Chester. He is the director of the Meta Center for Infrastructure and Sustainable Engineering at Arizona State University, where he maintains a research program focused on preparing infrastructure and their institutions for the challenges of the coming century. His work spans climate adaptation, disruptive technologies, innovative financing, transitions to agility and flexibility, and modernization of infrastructure management. Thank you, Mikhail. I will now hand over to you. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, everybody, and uh, glad to be participating here. Um, it's been about six years since I visited Melbourne, um, visited uh, Monash University and presented to a number of uh, public agencies there, I think in particular the transit agencies, so delighted to be talking to you guys now. Um, also, a couple years ago, I was um, I was in Queensland at, at Brisbane, Brisbane um, visiting some folks over there. So. Um, you know, I have a, a little bit of insight into the sort of climate issues that you guys are um, experiencing as they relate to infrastructure, but, uh, you know, I, I sort of welcome a, a lengthier discussion about that. So, um, you know, thanks for giving me the opportunity to, to talk to you all. Um, we do a lot of work in my center around uh, the very, very broad question of what does infrastructure mean for the next, you know, 200 years? I think 100 is kind of easy because it's, uh, given the rigidity of infrastructure, you know, what we put down today has a good chance of being around till the end of the century, a little bit longer. Um, but thinking even longer than that, um, you know, given an uncertain uh, world, uh, given volatility, accelerating conditions, um, you know, in the US at least, we talk a lot about the disrepair of infrastructure becoming a major uh, factor. Um, you know, the, the challenges for infrastructure are monumental. So. Um, when I talk about, talk about flexibility, um, I am talking somewhat broadly. I'll give you guys some specific sense of what I mean by that uh, in a little bit. But um, generally what I'm talking about is the ability to um, meet uh, rapidly changing demand conditions. So COVID's a great example of that. Um, you know, many of our infrastructure, at least in the US, were not able to scale down or you know, sometimes up very quickly. Um, and then I talk about, uh, you know, flexibility and agility from the perspective of uh, what our infrastructure are actually capable of doing, what services they're able to deliver um, in the environments that they are in. So uh, I'm coming to you from uh, beautiful Phoenix, Arizona, the Phoenix metro area, just to give you guys a little bit of context, because I think there is some, uh, some overlap of, of the challenges that we face in the Southwest US relative to Australia. So I think, um, you know, it's nice to talk to you guys, uh, at least from a knowledge sharing perspective at what we might learn from each other. But uh, Phoenix is a city that many people don't know much about. It's not a city that you, uh, not like a cosmopolitan city that you um, end up at eventually. You kind of have to intentionally go to it. However, it's not a small place. 
Phoenix is currently around 5.5 million people. That's up from about 1.5 million in 1990. So over about 30 years, we've had a tripling of population. We're expected to go to about 8.5 million in the coming decades. So uh, the metro area is roughly the 15th 1-5 largest metro region in the country. Um, the city of Phoenix, uh, which is one of the 28 cities in the Phoenix metro area, is the fifth largest city in the United States. So, um, you know, we have uh, a city in a desert, the Sonoran Desert. You know, we've got water issues, of course, uh, a lot of local water where we have to go pretty deep, about uh, 100 meters down for it, uh, large sort of energy costs associated with that. Um, you know, lots of quality issues associated with that. Uh, we have a lot of, um, you know, maybe a quarter of our water comes from nearby mountains. So a lot of people don't think of Phoenix as having a uh, geography, but it absolutely does. Um, so if you go north, west, uh, or east, you hit mountains very quickly and you go up those mountains and uh, climate changes very quickly. So uh, snowpack is a, a significant water supply for us and that has been shrinking. And then of course, um, the stereotype or what, what are uh, people often think of us as um, that being trucking water in or canaling water in from hundreds of kilometers away, that being the uh, California Canal or Colorado River Canal. Um, which we do, that, that's roughly a quarter to a third of our water, depending on the snowpack. So um, Phoenix is hot, if you haven't heard. Actually, it's really hot. Um, we have had, this is actually just from a few days ago, we have now hit uh, our 50th day over 110 degrees, which has obliterated the previous record. Um, I think we're probably at you know, 53 days at this point. Um, you know, the highs here in the peak of the summer are around 48 Celsius, if I'm doing my math correctly. Um, today was cool. It feels nice. It's only about 38 C. And um, this morning when I woke up at about 4.30 to walk our dogs, which is, you know, the safe time to do it, it was about 29 C. So it felt like I needed a jacket. Um, but, uh, you know, eight months of the year, it's it's quite mild. And, and actually, the weather, weather here is gorgeous. It's, you know, four months of extreme heat. So, you know, that might resonate with uh, some of the climates, you know, definitely in Australia, but um, some of the climates that you guys might deal with in your ser service territory. So um, jumping into the content, uh, you know, thinking about infrastructure, climate change, and what I would describe as uh, the broader challenge of, of the Anthropocene, right? So Anthro being man, Pocene or Scene being era, the era of man. Right, we're now in an era where human beings in many ways dominate and control, it's an important word and a very particular word, um, natural systems, right? So you're hard pressed to find an untouched natural system. Good, good luck finding that at all. Um, you know, water systems are almost entirely managed at this point, um, you know, pretty extensively uh, channelized and, and controlled in ways that move towards people, right? Um, but this is also true of the climate, you know, whether we're talking about CO2 into the air or you know, carbon capture and storage, kind of geoengineering out of the air, nutrient cycles, you know, so on and so forth. Um, but human beings have, you know, that we're the hyper keystone species um, and we have control over many of the Earth's systems, right? And we now see the effects of that. The planet is in a period of rapid, unpredictable and fundamental change that is literally global in scope. So we know, especially when it comes to climate, that the issues are not bounded by geopolitical boundaries, right? That doesn't make any sense actually in, in many ways when we think about climate. Um, you know, a, a state in the United States like California may turn off CO2 emissions, but, you know, if all the other states keep it going, um, you know, the effects are, are going to be felt um, nationally and globally. So there's evidence of this, right? So I don't know if you guys have seen this. Uh, these are what are called the great acceleration curves. And generally what they show is from 1950 on, we've seen an acceleration of lots of trends of human systems and natural systems, right? And, and it's uh, nonlinear, it's exponential. And it signals that um, something significant is happening, right? So um, what does that mean? Well, um, when we think about the significance of all of this change, right? So there's certain words that I use. Accelerating conditions, I just showed you a chart of that. Non-stationarity or uncertainty, depending on how specific we wanna be about statistics. Volatility is another important word, right? So we might put all these together or describe uh, trends in different ways, but what's important to recognize is that infrastructure is at the center of many of these. So climate is absolutely one of those, right? Cyber technologies, emerging and disruptive technologies that are, that are uh, coming, um, coming about, right? Faster and faster and faster, whether it's information and, and data and computation and 
artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all of those uh, uh, new gadgets, or you know, whether we're talking about electric vehicles or rooftop solar or anything like that, right? Um, in the US, we talk about financing or disrepair. There's sort of a lot of uncertainty around those issues. Um, you know, ideological extremism. Um, you know, we can't ignore the fact that infrastructure is increasingly at the center of um, ideological extremism um, in the sense that, you know, for example, in the United States, we've had lots of discussion about the post office delivering mail and, uh, you know, whether or not the post office is being, you know, dismantled uh, because, you know, it, it might uh, throw the election one way or another coming up in November, right? The, the conversations around the post office, absolutely nothing to do with the efficacy of communication, right? They have everything to do with something else. And we have to recognize that um, infrastructure is, is in many ways a political football nowadays. So that's the landscape. When I use the word landscape, I'm generally talking about these conditions um, that are moving in sort of unpredictable ways and, and you know, infrastructure is somewhat responsive to those. Um, I always like to give a little bit of history when thinking about infrastructure. And sorry, I'm going to give the history from a US perspective, but I would imagine it's not radically off uh, for Australia. So, you know, when we go back um, in time, you know, you basically have to go back to the agricultural revolution when you start seeing infrastructure um, in any sort of significant way appearing, that being like roads, ceramic manufacturing um, in particular. It's not really until the industrial era that the infrastructure that we have today emerges, or I'll put it differently, the infrastructure that we generally have today is very much designed around industrial era thinking. It's designed around industrial era goals. It's designed around industrial era landscapes or environments. Those environments often um, having assumptions based on stability built into that. And nowadays, you know, when we talk about sustainability, when we talk about climate, when we talk about emerging and disruptive technologies, when we talk about cyber warfare, when we talk about all of these sort of uh, forces that I described before, I think it's reasonable to ask the question of whether our infrastructure and how it is governed, the, the technical assets and how it's governed, um, should be structured the way they are for the problems of 2100 instead of the problems of 2000 and earlier. So I wanna pose this question to you guys right now to think about as I talk through the rest of these slides. If I were to say to Vic Water, start with a blank slate, how would you restructure your organization with absolutely no constraints for the problems that you face today? What would that look like? How would it be different than how you structure your organization currently? That's a really tough question to ask, right? Because institutions have momentum. Institutions have constraints. They have lock-in, right? Um, individuals and in institutions have identity. Right, we, we view our value in a certain way. And when somebody comes along and says, the organization should do something else, there's resistance because of that, right? So there's challenges of breaking that sort of those identity issues, but forget all that. How would you restructure Vic Water today? What would the departments look like? What would the technical expertise look like? How would teams be structured? How would you allocate financing, right? And that's a really, really important question to ask. I'll come back to that in a few minutes. So let's start with, I said, I'm going to talk about flexibility and agility. Well, I think to talk about flexibility and agility, you got to start with the rigidity, right? So rigidity is what we do. But generally when we use that term, um, you know, we don't really talk about it in, in, in a specific way. So what do we mean by rigidity? Um, you know, when I talk about rigidity, I'm talking about um, not just the life, lifetime of assets. You know, we, we design a, a water treatment plant to, you know, do its thing for 40 years, something like that, right? Or, or a pipe to be uh, a water distribution pipe to be underground for, for 10 years. Um, what I'm talking about is uh, not only that, but also the actual uh, governance and goals of that system, right? So those, those don't change as well as the sort of uh, assumptions about the environments in which it's gonna operate in. So why do we design these systems with rigidity? For a number of reasons that make a lot of sense. I'm not saying this is necessarily wrong, okay? One is we hedge risk, right? So when we say something's gonna be there for a long time, now we can, finance it in a sort of uh, uh, committed way, right? We can hire expertise 
in a particular way, right? Knowing that that asset will be there and certain types of capabilities are gonna be needed to take care of it and so on, right? There's economies of scale with it. There's a uh, marginal cost, right? Once you get it in, um, you know, it's sort of like a sunk cost, right? You're, you're sort of focused then um, on what comes next. It also signals commitment. So, um, you know, when you put a pipe under a road and you tell people water's gonna be there, right? They know they can build houses there, they can put buildings there and so on. The problem is that when you exceed the design envelope, whether it's climate, whether it's the demand conditions, whether it's um, you know the um, the technologies that are using it or what the service is supposed to do, we have a problem, right, with that rigidity. All of a sudden, um, that rigidity becomes a constraint that we need to work within. By that I mean we have to basically ask ourselves, how is it? that I can do this new thing within the constraints of that existing system. And what we call that is a gating function, right? Yes, you guys, uh, and we, we all can do good things within those constraints, but often we are constrained with how much we can do, how fast we can change, on what uh, scale we can change. Um, when I say that infrastructure are structured around principles of the last century, um, in the United States, I can say with certainty that the way that we organize the governance of infrastructure is modeled after the railroads that emerged in the 1900s and created what is called a divisional bureaucracy. The divisional bureaucracy essentially has a, a leader or set of leaders at the top that determine strategy and are largely responsible for making sense of how the world is changing and how th their business model is gonna remain viable. And underneath that, you have divisions. And each of those divisions is given a fair degree of autonomy, right? So when we talk about, sorry, I, uh, I know transport better than, than water, but when we talk about transport, um, you know, the roadway system, right? There's gonna be a, a traffic division. There's gonna be a, a you know, a construction um, rehabilitation division that does like asphalt, for example. Um, there's gonna be a motor vehicles registration division, right? And that model can work really effectively when, again, uh, conditions are fairly stable, when um, goals remain fairly consistent, and um, essentially the strategic leadership can imbue the autonomy to the division directors and middle managers to say, reach those goals within a budget and do so as efficiently as possible. Whatever additional innovation you do on top of that, good for you, okay? The problem is the divisional bureaucracy sort of unravels when the environment becomes unstable. One good reason for that is because in periods of instability, the problems become very different that you have to deal with. For example, climate change requires a heck of a lot of different disciplines that may often be siloed within those divisions. And you need the capability to extract the appropriate expertise from those divisions put it together somewhere else with the resources and management that it needs to then go out and make decisions, which the organization in a divisional bureaucracy is generally not structured to do. Uh, the other problem is that when chaos is happening, for example, a wildfire, the people that are best able to make sense of what are, is going on are generally frontline workers, not leadership in an office somewhere. I'm not saying leadership is invaluable or is, is unvaluable in that situation. I'm just saying your sensors, in this case, people, those who make sense of what's going on, the best sensors that you have are those on the front lines, kind of seeing what's going on, seeing what's happening to the hardware and so on. So I'll come back to that in a, in a few minutes. I'm going to skip this. So uh, I think I made this point and, uh, you know, as we shift from the industrial era and, and our legacy systems that are kind of structured around industrial era goals, uh, we need to start asking what it means to be able to function, more so thrive, in the next 100 to 200 years. And I'm gonna give you some idea of what that means, okay? So, I'm gonna use the word complexity, and I'm gonna try to focus on climate change, folks, because I know that's what, what you're particularly interested in, but I, I've gotta throw in a few other things, but I'm always gonna try to use climate change as, as my example, okay? Um, so just give me a little leeway there. But I'm gonna use the word complexity, all right? And as an academic, um, you know, complexity means something um, very specific to me, okay? So, um, 
there's a great classification of systems or, or uh, uh, components of systems called the CINEFIN framework, C-Y-N-E-F-I-N. The CINEFIN framework was developed by a Microsoft engineer in, I believe it was the mid 90s, maybe early 2000s. And he, uh, Snowden was, was the name of the guy in Snowden, came up with five categories or five sort of um, uh, regimes of a system. Simple, complicated, complex, chaotic, and disorderly. Simple is like your microwave. You don't need any serious training to use your microwave. Um, you can basically follow an instruction manual if you even need that, and um, you can make it work, okay? Complicated is generally where our infrastructure, infrastructure assets fall, generally. If I want to design a water treatment plant, I can't just grab any person off the street to do that. Uh, generally, I'm gonna need a college degree, maybe some more on the job training um, to make sense of, of what to do, okay? So, uh, you know, that requires specific expertise, but most importantly, cause and effect relationships are, are um, determinable, okay? So they may not be apparent, but you can figure them out. Complex is where I would argue our systems have gone, have evolved to. They are unpredictable. We often don't understand them from beginning to end anymore because we have layered technology on top of technology on top of technology onto them. Hold a wildfire over Victoria and you guys probably know that something bad will happen to your system, but if I ask you exactly what, where, and when, you'll probably say, well, no, we don't know. And that answer is actually quite reasonable. You shouldn't know the answer to that because cause and effect relationships are not apparent and are not necessarily determinable, okay? And that's for a number of reasons. There's feedback loops in the system. Uh, there's non-linearities in the system. Um, there's exceptions that have been instituted in the system over decades that may not be apparent. You have an old computer running with a new computer. You may not have expertise for that old computer or the software anymore, right? But you just hope it does what it's supposed to do, that sort of thing, right? Then of course, chaotic becomes quite important when we talk about climate change extreme events. Disorder is as you shift between one domain and the other. And what I'm gonna argue here is that the tools that we typically apply are for the complicated uh, system. We need to start moving towards the complex system. I'll come back to that. Talk about this a little bit. One of the um, major, so, so now I'm talking about what causes complexity in the system, okay? So one of the major sources of complexity is this idea of uncertainty, or more specifically, multiple layers of uncertainty. If you see me looking up, guys, it's because my uh, three-year-old is threatening to throw rocks at the window he's outside. Um, so, we call this, um, you know, we, can, we think of this often in, in the context of past and future uncertainty. So, so think about this. If I say to you guys, there's uncertainty in future climate, you're gonna say, yep, I already knew that, and I don't disagree. But what if I say to you, there's uncertainty in the past in terms of what you designed your systems to be able to deal with? So I'll give you an example. <clears throat> in 1950, you may have a legacy component from 1950, okay? And I'm, I'm making up this hypothetical, assuming that it's pretty much on par with the US. So in 1950, um, there was, let's say, a stormwater um, uh, pipe that was put under a road, um, you know, next to, for example, one, one of your water distribution pipes. And in 1950, an engineer was tasked with sizing the water pipe. How many centimeters should it be? Should it be four, should it be six, should it be 10, should it be 20? So the engineer basically went to whatever available data they had at the time and looked up based on probably extremely limited and highly uncertain data, right? Because this was the infancy of collecting data on climate conditions, right? So that, that engineer went in and said, okay, look, I think, I think based on, uh, a 24 hour precip, um, you know, uh, history that, you know, we've collected two data points on, um, this should be a 10 diameter pipe, okay? And those two data points may have been accurate, may have been low, may have been high, right? If they were high, then that asset was over-designed. 
no problem. It handled more water than it could have, right? It, it, than, than it experienced. What if it was low? Then that pipe probably wasn't able to handle um, the stormwater, the rain event that, that uh, it was asked to facilitate. And there was flooding. So over the decades, um, folks have probably come along and, and uh, upgraded that pipe given you know, potential hotspots of, of flooding, right? But um, nowadays we have much better data just because we have his, much richer historical records, right? So um, what's going on? What if you think about a future where I tell you that infrastructure in the past were over-designed in certain areas and in the future need to be more intensely designed because precip is gonna get worse? Do you need to upgrade that asset? That's one form of a uh, combination of uncertainty, right? Then the problem is these other, what we call the elevated domains, where the past uncertainty and future uncertainty are going in the wrong directions. We, we basically just don't know, um, you know whether or not something is capable of handling um, you know, future climate, right? So that's a source of complexity in the system. I've mentioned a few of these, um, so I won't, really dive into them because I have, I think, only eight minutes left uh, to make sure there's time for Q&A. But merging and disruptive technologies, voluminous information. If you're not designing infrastructure for the massive information flows, artificial intelligence, for example, that we're experiencing, um, how people um, uh, in um, probably city-wide, region-wide understand, have cognition about what's going on about your system based on the information flows that they're receiving that you guys may not be providing anymore that like Google might provide, right? For traffic, for example, um, then you are designing obsolescence into your system, right? The sharing, sharing economy, I think is a major one, ideological polarization. And then I'm not gonna talk about this. I love to talk about this. There's not enough time, cyber warfare, cyber technology, cybersecurity. If you are ignoring the reality that infrastructure are now a battlefield, that uh, foreign adversaries that have typically had um, less um, military capacity in the conventional way relative to, you know, the United States, maybe Australia, and have now used other tactics to, um, you know, modernize warfare, right, where infrastructure is now often held hostage by uh, these attacks, right? Case in point, we saw when Russia attacked Ukraine, um, you know, a, a power system operator in Ukraine watched as uh, their mouse went across the, sling, the screen and click, click, clicked on substations, disabling one after another, turning off power to a major region in the country. Um, you know, uh, hopefully you guys are aware of these sorts of issues. You have cybersecurity protocols in place to, to sort of understand what's going on and, and uh, how to prepare yourself for those. That's part of this complex landscape. Okay, so what do we do? My last few minutes here. I don't know, sorry, um, but I have some idea and I'm gonna keep working on it. So, um, I am not gonna pretend that I can sit here and tell you, instead of designing your systems like this, you should design them like that. No, I actually think there's a number of right ways to do it, and there's probably a few wrong ways to do it. But what I do see emerge in my research as well as other research on this topic is a few commonalities. One is you gotta design for agility flexibility. I've been mentioning that, I'll come into it now. You have to design for complexity. This idea that cause and effect relationships in your system are no longer apparent. You have to design for failure from extreme events. And most importantly, stop thinking about your system as a water service and start thinking about it as a knowledge service around water. I'll tell you why that's important in a few minutes. First, agility and flexibility. So when we look at infrastructure and the words agility, flexibility, if you guys Google this, you'll probably find my stuff and then you'll find almost nothing, which case in point, there's almost nothing, okay? When we did this search a few years ago and I found almost nothing, I said, this is a problem, right? For the reasons I've already mentioned, let's look at industries that are doing agility flexibility, auto automobile manufacturing, um, information communication technologies do agility fairly well. Um, there's a few other communities that do it that, that uh, sorry, I'll skip over the business community, but what we tend to see are some, what I call uh, competencies that, that emerge. And guys, you can see the papers for all this um, at the bottom, they're happy to provide. But uh, you know, one is um, being able to swap out hardware. And that's not just look, you know, we use standard size pipes like 10 and 14 and 20 centimeters. It's providing the capacity to, if you need to, given 
a shift in, in environmental conditions that you've just become aware of, be able to very quickly um, upscale or downscale. That's, that's one of it. Another aspect of that is making sure that your hardware talks to each other and talks to you in a coherent way. That's about information, it's about cyber tech, but it's also about protocols and standards where things communicate effectively, okay? Substituting out software for hardware. So I've, I've mentioned this, I'm not gonna go through all these, I'll, I'll go through some and I've touched on some of these elsewhere, but um, software for hardware turns out to be really important because when you tend to swap out um, hardware that tends to be dumb, so to speak, with software that controls that hardware and tends to be more intelligent, you one, get more capability, two, you get um, uh, the ability to often do multiple things, okay? M multifunctionality is what we call it, okay? So there are many ways to do this, um, uh, but I'm talking sort of particular to the hardware. I'll come back to these in the next few minutes on, on other ROMs. When you switch from complicated to complex, so this is the figure I showed you guys before, your protocols for how you approach the system should change. So in the complicated, this is probably how you guys do business right now. You kind of get a sense of what's going on. You collect data, you talk to people, uh, you have experts that you send out into the field. You then analyze that information, quantitative and qualitative. You then go through a process where you identify what the solution is and you go through the process of, of implementing, right? Problem is in a complex world that, again, that cause and effect chain um, of, of what's going on in your system is not as apparent. Um, and, and this also applies in the chaotic sort of climate realm. Think about more shifting to probing and testing. This idea that you're going to try to uh, implement something to get data back on what's going on, okay? So you might trial something. Um, you might implement something with a planned obsolescence that you wouldn't normally have done, right? And you have a commitment to going back and saying, I know I put that thing in the last five years. I can't leave it in for 10. I got to go back and collect the data because it's not about that asset being there for a long time. It's about the information and knowledge I receive from uh, putting that asset in, trialing something new, okay? So, um, you know, we've, we've sort of coined this the Cinefin framework for infrastructure. I'm down to my last few slides here, folks. Um, get out of the mentality of the response to climate change is hardening, strengthening, armoring everything. Because my guess is you guys are already running into the limitations of that thinking. Because if I say to you, but what about a scenario at 2050 or 2100 where this asset is still around and you are at the most extreme climate scenario and you say to me, at that extreme, we can't afford to build and maintain that asset. The public will never allow us to put that massive asset in their backyard, right? Think about uh, augmenting the service in other ways. This is called graceful extensibility, right? So. If wildfires and um, post-fire debris flows are inevitable and they're gonna take out your assets, you might wanna consider how you supply water during these increasingly likely failure events, right? And then of course, sustained adaptability, which is this commitment to change that, you know, get away from this, this rigidity mindset and, and basically say, I'm gonna keep coming back to it. Um, I'm gonna skip that one. I wanna make this last point in, in my last minute here. Design for knowledge. So there's a great law uh, out there called, it, it's, it's sort of a sort of philosophical thing called the law of requisite variety, or you can just think of it the law of requisite complexity, which basically says that an organization needs to be able to manage as many states as the uh, system can find itself in. And what we're seeing is that with all of these sort of forces, climate change and otherwise, that, that we're thinking about in the Anthropocene, cyber tech, um, you know, disrepair, um, you know, in, information flows that are affecting how people use infrastructure, the number of states are increasing. And that means that you guys, as the governing body of that infrastructure that needs to be able to respond to all those states, needs to be able to have the ability to make sense of, 
that's a great, uh, really important word, sense me of what's going on. So think about how you shift your organization from one that is about providing water and maintaining assets. I'm overgeneralizing guys, sorry. I don't know the specifics of what you guys do and I'm sure, sure it's uh, far more nuanced than that. So just give me a little leeway here. Um, but think about shifting from that sort of mentality to um, one where you are uh, an organization primarily about knowledge making for this increasing complexity, that you are restructuring your organization to make sense of uh, what's going on. The divisional bureaucracy may not be the right way to do it. You may need to think about how you have flexibility in um, your funding, in how your teams are structured. Are people able to ditch one team when there's chaos and go to another? Um, do you have resources in place for those teams when it happens? When uh, climate change um, is happening, do you have a particular division that deals with it? Or is this a problem that spans all divisions? Same thing with cyber warfare, right? This is an issue that spans all divisions. So you just add another division to deal with it where you silo that expertise? Or do you think maybe about a different model where expertise is sort of um, cross division or in you know very different structure altogether, right? So um, there's, uh, there's some great uh, work on um, what is uh, described as administrative leadership, which is uh, probably what you guys emphasize now, which is essentially leadership for stability, okay? And um, that's generally how infrastructure in the US has, has been governed for about 100 years. Then there's adaptable leadership. And this describes a situation where you guys have created the flexibility for ad hoc teams to form with the right resources with the ability to be semi-autonomous and, and go out and make sense of what's going on, right? That, that's, that's one aspect of it, right? But most importantly, how do you shift between the two? Because I'm not advocating that you need to go entirely to adaptable leadership. For Your systems are gonna exist for a long time and you will have periods of stability. So you need administrative leadership. You'll also need adaptable leadership. As such, you're gonna need, need the ability to transition between the two. You're gonna to have to give your organization the capability or the flexibility and agility to be able to shift between those two, okay? So that is um, a, a major challenge. And, and I go back to my initial question, which is where I will end, of if you were to restructure VicWater with no constraints, dropping identity issues, okay? I'm not gonna be relevant and therefore they're gonna fire, fire me. That's important, absolutely. But if you're gonna drop, just sort of uh, put that to the side for a minute, right? How do you uh, restructure Vic Water for 2100? And how is that different from today? So thank you all. Um, I think these slides are gonna be made available so you guys should be able to see these articles, which um, we actually try to write a lot of these um, in, in not academic ease, so, so they're sort of more consumable for um, a broader audience. And uh, with that, thank you, um, Joe, and, and thank you everybody else for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Mikhail. And uh, to quote one of the comments we've had in the chat, that was an outstanding and very thought provoking presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, we have had a question come through from Nigel, uh, who says that he's been working on complex decision making in agriculture for 10 years. The theory says use storytelling and gut feeling when making complex decisions. Can we apply this in the water sector? Yeah, absolutely. So Nigel, right on. There, there's there's a whole body of, of uh... Uh, academics that do this work on, you know, how do you do complex decision making? And um, one of the key things about um, decision making under complexity is you open up your solution space when you do what's called knowledge co-production. That is a fancy way of saying you bring a diverse set of stakeholders to the table. And by diverse, I don't mean your the Vic Water management team. I mean across Vic Water across your um, your consumers, across maybe other agencies, right? It, it, as, as much diversity as you can, you can manage, right? But um, that tends to be a really important aspect of it. Um, Nigel, storytelling and gut feeling are um, ways of describing, um, uh, the, the word being, let me think about it for a second, uh, emoting, okay? So one of the things that you have to get people to do as you think about opening up the solution space is to relate to the problem, but more so to embed themselves in that problem where they actually have like an emotional 
uh, reaction. I don't, I don't mean like crying or, or breaking down. I mean like um, they feel um, that this is serious and something that needs to be solved, okay? One of the great ways of doing that, Nigel um, and everybody else, is game playing. It may sound crazy. We piloted infrastructure, exclamation mark, the board game, where we did a coupled power water system and um, it was cascading to failure under a extreme climate event. Maybe, maybe one day we can get you guys to play it. Um, and we had the water people. We actually brought in, um, you know, the, the Phoenix water people. We brought in the Phoenix power people. And we said, okay, it's cascading to failure, um, perturbed by whatever. What do you do? And first few rounds, they do what they were trained to do. Okay, nothing wrong with that. But um, after a while, they realized, after iterating a few times and us giving them a few hints and clues that if they collaborated, they could actually slow down the cascade. More importantly, we actually showed them ways in, in which they could do preventative maintenance to actually significantly reduce the likelihood of that cascade, right? So, you know, we, we sort of embed them in this process. Um, we have a, an online model called the RISE. Uh, I'm typing it in the chat right now. RISE.resilientinfrastructure.org which is, um, you guys might like this, and maybe we could do this with you, but um, it's, it's essentially that process of integrated power water systems um, being perturbed by something, climate or otherwise. We could actually uh, do like um, uh, warfare attacks, uh, electromagnetic pulse, a bomb being dropped on something. Uh, we do a lot of work with the military on that. But um, yeah, all of that, um, you know, we were able to put in front of you wherever you are in whatever corner of the world. So um, thanks, Nigel. Thanks, and I think that also covers uh, Stephen's question around scenario planning. Um, it sounds like playing that game would be a great way of um, assisting with scenario planning. Yeah, and, and um, scenario planning is, is it very much aligns with that, absolutely, and is remarkably important. And the challenge um, I would contend with climate change and scenario planning is that the scenarios are especially the further out you go into the future are not going to have probabilities associated with them and this is what you call deep uncertainty and i know the um csiro folks think about this a lot um, so you might talk to them the rand folks in um in the us think about this a lot so there's a lot of good people who talk about this but uh you know th there's there's um scenarios where you're able to say this is more likely than not and then you know there are scenarios where you say it's possible but we have no idea what the probability is and that requires a diff totally different set of tools um, when there's no probability than there when there is a probability and what i would um uh, i'll leave with this point i'm not going to go into it it's another 45 minutes but um the concept of robust decision making how do you minimize regret in your decisions right so yeah we want to do something about infrastructure and climate change but there's going too far in the sense where you might bankrupt yourself or you might design and build something that's over designed, that's just not needed, right? Because the uncertainty, there's uncertainty, right? So, so you may go overboard, right? And, and you end up under and you may have overspent precious resources, something like that. So there's a, there's a way of thinking called um, robust decision-making, which is all about minimizing regret. I don't wanna reduce it to cost benefit analysis, but it essentially involves cost benefit analysis uh, integrated with scenario planning and, um, you know, I think is a really valuable tool for these sorts of problems. Thank you. And although we have had a couple more questions come through, I'm afraid I'm going to have to call time because we are on a fairly tight schedule. Mikhail, thank you so much for joining us from Phoenix. Um, and uh, good luck with the with the weather over there and, uh, and the wildfires and everything else that's happening in your country at the moment. Um, we, we send you our best mm -hmm. and we really appreciate your time this morning. It's been fascinating. Thank you. Thanks again, everybody. And uh, again, glad to have the opportunity to talk to you. Have a good morning. Thank you. We are now going to take a short five minute break and uh, then we'll be back with our next speaker. So it is my pleasure to uh, welcome and introduce Dr. Rachel Carey as our next presenter. She is a lecturer in food systems in the Faculty of Veterinary and Agricultural Sciences at the University of Melbourne, where her teaching and research focuses on the governance of sustainable and, and resilient food systems. 
Rachel leads the Footprint Melbourne Research Project, which is looking at strengthening the resilience of Melbourne's food system to shocks and stresses related to climate change and pandemic. Thank you, Rachel. Hello, um, thank you very much for the chance to come here and speak to you. So my expertise is not in water, it's in food systems. So I focus on what happens and getting our food to us from the farm to the fork. So I'm not gonna to talk to you about water. I'm, you're obviously the experts on that. I'm gonna to talk to you about food. So this presentation here focuses on water for food um, and the role of water policy and the decisions that are made uh, in the water sector in, in strengthening the resilience of our food system to shocks and stresses, particularly shocks and stresses related to climate change and also to pandemic. So I'm going to talk about the pressures that are facing the food system currently from increasing shocks and stresses, particularly climate related, the need for an integrated whole of government policy approach to strengthen the resilience of our food system and really why water policy is central to that type of whole of government policy approach and what the opportunity is for the water sector to make a contribution to ensuring a plentiful fresh food supply for a growing population in the face of increasing shocks and stresses to the food supply. So of course for many Victorians um, the last few months have probably been their first experience of seeing disruption to the food supply. So we've seen you know, empty supermarket shelves and COVID-19 um, has had impacts throughout the food supply chain, in addition to the impacts of the panic buying from consumers that led to empty supermarket shelves. And of course, the pandemic has also come on the back of recent bushfires and drought that also um, impacted fresh food supplies. In other words, what we've been seeing recently is the impacts um, of compounding or co-occurring events that have all affected the food supply at the same time. But we've got a narrative in Australia that we're a food secure country. Having said that, though, around 4% of Australians under normal times uh, run out of food and can't afford to buy more. So that's over a million people. And of course, that figure is rising quite sharply as a result of the economic crisis that's currently worsening. And I think what we're seeing at the moment is a growing public awareness of the impacts of potential shocks and stresses on our food supply and the potential for disruptions to food supply, particularly from rising food prices. And of course, we saw this during the millennium drought in Australia. Between 2005 and 2007, food prices in Australia rose around 12%, but the price of fresh vegetables actually rose 33%, and the price of fresh fruit rose 43%. And that was due to the impacts of lack of water for food production. Now, similarly, in 2002 to 2003, the price of fresh vegetables rose around 13% under drought conditions. So fruit and vegetable prices are particularly hard hit during times of water scarcity because we mainly source our fruit and vegetable supply domestically. So we don't import much fresh fruit and vegetables. The fruit and vegetables that we do import are mostly processed. So we're quite dependent on our domestic uh, on our domestic fruit and vegetable supply chains. And that's why we see those kinds of impacts when we have um, climate related events. Now, a key issue here is that most experts do expect global food prices to be more volatile in future. And we expect more price spikes because of the impacts of climate shocks and stresses, but also due to other pressures on the global food supply. So those pressures include the fact that demand for food is, is rising globally generally because, of course, of population growth and because of changing dietary habits, particularly rising consumption of animal proteins, so meat and dairy in emerging economies. And then we've got declining supplies of all the natural resources that underpin food production. And that includes declining supplies of phosphate, which underpins conventional fertilizers. Of course, declining supplies of farmland due to rapid urbanization. And we've seen that on the fringe of Melbourne particularly. And there's a need to decouple the food system from fossil fuels because they underpin everything in the food system from fertilizers right through to, to transportation. We've also got high levels of food waste where we know around a third of food that's produced is wasted globally. And that, again, is a waste of the natural resources embedded in that food. And just turning to water, of course, around 70 percent of the world's fresh water is used for agriculture globally. And we've got increasing competition for that water from other uses and also from the need to restore environmental flows in the world's major river basins, including, of course, in the Murray-Darling Basin. 
So my point here is that this combination of pressures is likely to lead to increasing volatility in global food supplies. So if our capacity in Victoria is constrained in terms of our ability to produce food by increasing water scarcity, then the assumption that we can simply source deficits in our food supply from somewhere else is becoming increasingly problematic because the global food system itself is under pressure from a range of growing environmental constraints. So the key point to take away here really is that the evidence points to the need to take a precautionary approach and to engage in long-term planning to strengthen the resilience of the state's food supply to future shocks and stresses. And also that water policy is a key part of this. So climate predictions, of course, suggest that water availability is likely to be significantly reduced in major irrigation regions in Australia in the future. And of course, there's been much investment in regions like the Murray-Darling Basin to improve the efficiency of irrigation um, infrastructure. What I want to do here is focus instead on the opportunities to strengthen the resilience of the food system by making more wastewater available for food production on the peri-urban fringes of cities in Australia, where of course, most of the population is located. I lead a project called the Foodprint Melbourne Project. And what we've been doing in the project is investigating opportunities for strengthening resilience of food production on Melbourne's fringe. The project is funded by the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation. And we have a wide range of project partners. They include the city of Melbourne, the Interface Councils, the Perry Urban Group of Rural Councils and Port Phillip and Western Port Catchment Management Authority, in addition to a number of the individual local governments on Melbourne's fringe. So we've been doing this research project since 2015 and we've produced quite, quite a, a significant evidence base about food production on the fringe of Melbourne and about the factors affecting production. What our research has found is that Melbourne's food bowl, by which I mean these two peri-urban rings around the city, which are in green and blue on this map here, this food bowl region produces enough food or did produce enough food in 2015 to meet around 41% of greater Melbourne's food needs. The region is particularly important to the production of perishable foods and it produces around half of the vegetables currently grown in the state of Victoria and over 90% of fresh berries, but also a wide variety of other foods as well. Now, all of Australia's major state capitals are surrounded by food bowls that are highly productive and are important, particularly to production of perishable foods, including perishable um, vegetables. Production in this region around Melbourne, what we call Melbourne's food bowl, is also very important economically. So it contributes around $2.45 billion annually to the economy through primary production and through related secondary food manufacturing. And it also provides around 21,000 full-time equivalent jobs. And what we found through our modelling was that if this region continues to grow as it has in the past, with most of its growth on the urban fringe at relatively low rates of urban density, then by the time Melbourne reaches a population of 7 million, the capacity of that food bowl to feed the city could drop to 18% due to both a higher population and loss of farmland on the city fringe. And of course, continued loss of farmland on the city fringe and that lack of certainty about the future of that area also makes it difficult to invest in water infrastructure in the region because it's difficult to invest in 50-year assets when you're not sure if they're still going to be there um, in the next 10 years or so. So we have proposed a vision for a more um, resilient city food bowl where recycled water is used to produce food on the city fringe. So, in fact, we've argued um, that the land close to the city's water treatment plants is some of the most um, strategically important agricultural land that we have in the state because of its proximity to two sources of wastewater. But this farmland, of course, is currently among some of the most at-risk land that we have as well because of its proximity to the urban growth boundary. So this entry is our vision for a more resilient um, city food bowl where we'd have drought resilient uh, areas of food production on the fringe of the city, close to the city's water treatment plants, where we can use recycled water to continue producing food, particularly during times of drought. Now, of course, recycled water already is used to produce food close to the city's water treatment plants, both the eastern, whoops, sorry, 
I was expecting something else to happen on the slide there, both the eastern and western treatment plants, but also some of the other smaller treatment plants on the city fringe. But a relatively small amount of recycled water is currently used to produce food. So in 2016, we found that around 6% of the available wastewater was used to grow food, and around 84% of that available wastewater was actually discharged at sea. And our modelling suggested that if around 10% of that water that was unused was um, taken and used to produce food, it would be enough to grow around half of the vegetables that Greater Melbourne's population needs. The proportion of wastewater used to produce food has increased since then, and it was around 11% in 2018-19, but that still means that there's really significant potential in the amount of unused um, recycled water at the moment. So there's an opportunity to make much more of this water available to food production if we invest in greater infrastructure to store the water, to pipe it to farmers and to treat it, of course, to appropriate quality as well. And there are, of course, proposed projects um, that have been uh, that have been proposed in the past to open up areas of, of new irrigated production out towards Baliang and to the southeast of Melbourne. Um, and these, of course, are the types of projects that we might be talking about. So our research has identified some opportunities for greater use of recycled water and stormwater for agriculture. Um, in Melbourne's food bowl. And these are some of the quotes from interviews that we conducted with stakeholders. So one of the key issues, of course, is as the population grows on the urban fringe, more wastewater is actually being generated than can be reused within those urban areas. So there's an opportunity to, to supply that water to nearby agricultural areas. And it's an opportunity to really rethink the way that recycled water is costed and to significantly reduce the cost to farmers if we start to factor in what's already being, um, how much money is already being spent to treat that water and to just charge it at sea. And if we more fully consider the broad range of benefits from actually doing that, which are really social benefits, health benefits from uh, a good uh, supply of fresh vegetables on the city fringe, environmental and economic benefits. And these are all benefits of reusing that water for agriculture. There's also, of course, potential to harvest stormwater for agriculture if we can overcome the challenges of how to store that water until farmers need it in the right season and how to treat that water to an appropriate um, quality. And of course, the amount of stormwater being generated um, from water events is, is a significant issue and particularly will be as the urban fringe um, expands and as we're concreting more areas out on that fringe. So I think that the new integrated water management framework that has been introduced is an opportunity to think about better integrating water management and land use management, and also an opportunity to think a bit more holistically about the relationship between water and food supply and the impacts of water policy decisions on our food system. The development of the policy Recycling Victoria in a New Economy is also an opportunity to think about how wastewater can support the development of new protected agriculture industries as part of circular food economies. So as the climate changes, um, of course, more farmers are turning to protected cropping systems, which allow them to uh, mitigate climate extremes and to supply, uh, apply inputs like water and nutrients very efficiently. These systems are typically not reliant on soil, so they can be located in industrial and commercial areas close to the city. One example is Sundrop Farm in, or in Port Augusta, which grows tomatoes for coals, and they use a mix of fresh water and seawater, which is desalinated using solar energy. The fringes of our cities are in many ways ideal places to grow food um, in protected closed loop production systems or in regenerative agriculture systems as well because of their access to waste streams from cities. So that of course includes wastewater from city water treatment plants but also organic waste and food waste. Household food waste collections now being introduced across uh, Metro Melbourne and that waste is being composted and then can be used to also produce biofertilizers. But of course, compost is a very bulky product. So you want to reuse that compost close by on farms that are near to the city. 
but it also makes sense to keep some food production close to the city as a buffer against future shocks and stresses. So in an extreme drying scenario in a traditional irrigation region like the Murray-Darling Basin, there may not be enough water left in the system to support current levels of food production. And we may need to move some water intensive production back to the fringes of cities where there are more secure sources of wastewater available. And cities, of course, can also be cut off by extreme climate events, which happened in Brisbane during the 2010, 2011 floods, which cut off the major highway up the East Coast and effectively cut off the city's food supply for a while. So we need to think about um, how we keep some food production close to cities as part of a more resilient food system. During COVID-19, of course, we've also seen the impacts of national and state border closures on the movement of goods, including the movement of food. So access to global and national sources of food is, of course, an important part of a more resilient food supply, but so are local and regional food supplies. So it is important that we do keep some local food production close to Melbourne as much as we possibly can and close to other major state capitals around the country as well, so that city populations don't become entirely dependent on more distant sources of food. So what we want to do is to plan now for how we achieve that, and that will require strong protection for farmland close to Melbourne. And the current Victorian government initiative to protect Melbourne's strategic agricultural land is, of course, also a very important part of that. But it also requires strong water policy. So water policy is really central to a policy roadmap. That's really my key point here. Water policy is central to a policy roadmap for a more sustainable and resilient um, city food bowl, particularly policy settings that aim to increase water use for food production from recycled urban wastewater. To promote a resilient and sustainable food system, you need to take a food systems approach to policy, which means joined up whole of government policy that aims to promote food production on Melbourne's fringe and the fringes of other um, other state capitals and water policy needs to be at the heart of that type of policy approach. Now one of the best things of course about Melbourne is it's fantastic food but one of the reasons that we have such great food in, in Melbourne is because of the abundance of fresh food growing close to the city. If we want to keep that fresh food production close to Melbourne it's not going to be enough to just protect the farmland. It is equally important to promote the viability of farming in those areas. And a crucial part of that is water access. So really what I'm arguing here, and I will finish up soon, I'm aware that um, obviously we've got issues of time, so I'll try to be short and leave plenty of time for questions. What I'm arguing here really is that the business case for investment in new infrastructure to deliver um, recycled water to farms needs to take a broader food systems view. A food systems framing of the business case would recognise the broad public benefits in strengthening, strengthening the resilience of our food supply to future shocks and stresses and would also recognise that we're in a time where we do have increasing shocks and stresses on food supply um, from a number of a number of um, issues. So what it's about here really is securing a fresh, healthy food supply for a growing population in a warming climate and creating a buffer or insurance policy against the impacts of more frequent shocks and stresses on our food supply and on food prices and water policy and increased investment particularly in the use of wastewater, um, recycled wastewater for food production is a crucial part of achieving that. And I think that I will um, finish up there just to keep things short, given the uh, problems that we're having with time today and to allow plenty of time for questions. Thank you so much, Rachel, and apologies again that we had to um, shorten your presentation due to the, the timing issues. But we do have some questions that have come through in the chat. Uh, so I will run through some of those. And the first one is a fairly, I hope, quick question from Nigel, uh, which is why isn't the Goulburn Valley considered part of Melbourne's food bowl? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So really, um, 
the definition that we've taken for Melbourne's food bowl is a kind of common sense definition that most stakeholders understand of where the peri-urban boundary is around Melbourne. So essentially, um, the peri-urban area of Melbourne um, that's kind of connected to the city directly is largely considered to be the area that includes the interface councils and then the area that includes the peri-urban group of rural councils. So, of course, the Goulburn Valley is a really important area for producing food, as are other regions of the Murray-Darling Basin. The Murray-Darling Basin produces around 40% of the nation's food. So um, the, the idea here is that we're really drawing attention to this these other hidden food bowls that surround cities, including Melbourne. Thank you. Another question, uh, do you think hydro panels could be part of the water supply solution? Um, that's an interesting question. And as a, I'm going to be honest here, that as a food systems person, I'm not sure that I'm across enough the technical potential of hydro panels. Um, so I don't I don't really pretend to understand the technicalities there sufficiently. But look, I think I would say that we need to be looking at all potential technologies mm -hmm. here. Really, you know, um, it's it's about not putting all your eggs in one basket, I think, and about exploring all the potential options that's going to include. Now, I think looking at stormwater as well as looking at recycled wastewater for food production. But what I'm really arguing here, I guess, is that that decisions in relation to water policy in the water sector start to really think about the impacts on, on food supply and food systems. Thank you. Uh, a question here from Robin. Uh, she says, my understanding is that salt loads are still a significant issue for recycled water, use, particularly near our industrial processes. Is there a clever solution to this that is not reliant on high capital? Yeah, uh, ab absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Looks, um, salinity levels are still an issue in relation to recycled water. Of course, lots of different ideas have been proposed, um, many of which just cost too much, of course, and are very energy intensive solutions. Um, so one of the solutions that, of course, is still being used today is just shandying down the water with river water um, to reduce those salt levels. Uh, I'm not aware of any magic bullet solution mm. that has emerged to that, but I'm aware of a number of different projects around at the moment that are looking at how to reduce those salt levels in, in different ways. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so one of the key messages from your presentation was around the need for a strong water policy. Angela's asking, do you think the Water for Victoria policy, the state government's current uh, water policy, delivers that? Um, that's, that's a really good question. Um, look, I think it goes some way, but I would say that it, it still could focus more strongly um, on considering the impacts of those decisions on food. Uh, I would like to see much stronger targets for the amount of water that should be recycled. I would like to see us tracking how much wastewater is actually used to produce food. I'd like to see us reporting on that each year. So I'd like to see that being mandatory so that we can start to track how much of that water is actually being used to, um, to produce food. And I really think that what we're going to need here also is um, it's new new ways of thinking about how we cost the benefits of recycled water more broadly um, and that policy should be you know starting to think about this in a more holistic more holistic way but I think really if um, the water sector is going to be empowered to do this then we do need the right policy settings in place and I think the policy settings need to um, need to make clear that the water sector is empowered to do this. At the moment, it's quite difficult because it really um, means that water retailers need to go out, to survey the community and to understand, you know, what the community's views are on that in order to really get a mandate to go ahead. We need to move beyond that. Right. It needs to be it needs to be just considered as common sense. and The policy settings need to support that. OK. OK, we have a couple more questions that we'll just finish up the session with. So Jacinta says, given that 70 percent of Victoria's water is consumed by agriculture, how could the 30 percent of recycled water have a significant impact on food production? Actually, I'd like to say that the figure that I gave for 70 percent was global figure. So nationally, it's more like 60 percent of water is used to produce food nationally. And that's probably that at state level as well. And that's because we've actually become much more efficient about how to do right. that through through drought. Um, 
so how can we use that that 30 so in terms of the question how can we use that other 30 percent um more efficiently um look i guess that's looking at the non-food sector and how it is that we you know how it is that we use water but generally speaking as um as not as other uses of water increase in terms of a growing population most of that water tends to come from agriculture um and really what i what i would point to is the opportunity for the 80 percent plus of recycles of wastewater you know, that's recycled that isn't currently used for any other purpose and is mainly discharged at sea because it's seen as being a cheaper way to dispose of the water we, we've got to move beyond that kind of thinking mm. that just says look what's the most cost effective way to dispose of the water and start to think about uh, the, all the other benefits from reusing that water in other ways. But we do need more, we do need different frameworks to think about that sort of costing. Okay, and just finally, we have a question from Ian, which may be a rhetorical question. He says, much of Melbourne's water comes from Gippsland. Shouldn't recycled wastewater be returned to Gippsland? <laughs> Look, yeah, I, I think I'm actually not going to, I'm not going to probably get into the <laughs> politics of all that um, or the politics of, you know, um, uh, whether water should be going from the Murray Darling Basin down to Melbourne or anywhere else, you know. I mean, I guess that's about uh, that's about balancing the water needs of different water users. There's probably there's probably a point there, um, but yeah, I think I'd rather not step into that one. Very wise, fair enough. Um, thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, we really appreciate the time you've taken to be with us today, and we appreciate your patience in seeing us through this technical problem that we had. Um, and a reminder to everybody that the session has been recorded, so you will be able to watch the replay when it is available next week. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. All right. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, moving right along so that we can get everybody into a lunch break before the afternoon sessions, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome our next presenter, Rosie Ween. Rosie is CEO of WaterAid. She is a passionate advocate for human rights, gender equality, and universal access to water, sanitation, and hygiene. She has two decades of international development experience, having lived and worked in Indonesia for six years before joining WaterAid Australia at its inception in 2004. And so I will say in my best schoolgirl Indonesian to you, Rosie, Salamat datang, and I will hand over to you now. Terima kasih. Wow, what a wonderful welcome. And I'm so delighted to be joining you all. I'd like to acknowledge that I am joining you from what always has been and always will be Aboriginal land on the, on the lands of the Wurundjeri people. And I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and also extend that respect to all First Nations people joining us today and presenting at this important conference. Um, and I've been looking at the chat box and who's there, and I can see many familiar names and organisations there. So it's wonderful to be connecting with you all. And congratulations again to Vic Water for this conference, but also the really important work that you do. And I'm so excited because as part of our partnership with Vic Water, we're fundraising together for a project in Papua New Guinea. And this project is going to improve access to clean water and decent toilets and hygiene in 12 schools in two districts. And it's going to impact the lives of 3,500 students and teachers. We're gonna be working with our partners from the schools and local government to improve facilities for water and toilets and also do menstrual hygiene work and some operations and maintenance. Sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? We'll do some work, make sure that there's water in schools, toilets in schools, talk about periods, talk about how to dispose of sanitary pads. In my now nearly, well, just over 16 years at WaterAid, I've been trying to work on this, how do I tell the story? How do we tell the story of the work that we do? The bigger picture that reflects, because our work is anything but simple. And at this time, you know, when we're under so much pressure and our teams are working so hard, I've never been prouder of our team. So I wanna to try to bring to life for you the work that our team does. 
And as I said, I can see that there are people that know water aid, and absolutely, of course, experts in the water industry. So perhaps much of what I share will be familiar to you because you know how essential safe water is, but also how much work goes on behind the scenes to do that. You know, just look at what happened as a result of Sylvan Dam and the storms. I'm sorry to those of you from Melbourne Water and Yarra Valley Water and Southeast Water to bring that up, but it, it, it's such a good example, isn't it? Of the incredible work that happens behind the scenes for that simple thing to turn on a tap and flush our toilet. And I wanna thank all of you for that work that you've been doing, especially during COVID times, that essential frontline work of the water industry. Look at the convening power of the water sector that you can bring together other partners to have conversations, for example, of the overlap of water and energy. Look at the forum that happened in Goulburn Valley uh, just last week. You know how important diversity is to ensure that we get inclusive outcomes. Across Victoria, we have such a strong focus on women in leadership. We have the groundswell of support around pride in water the new Water Able Network, and of course, thriving communities. So much of what I talk about, I'm sure is familiar to you, but perhaps some of it, the scale of the challenges and the complexity and the lack of resourcing, perhaps not so familiar. But before I tell you more about that bigger story of the work that we do in Papua New Guinea, I wanna go back to the very beginning. I wanna share a bit more about the history of water aid, but I don't wanna do that myself. I want to share a video with you where I sat down in conversation a couple of years ago with Tony Kelly and Grant Hill, two of our founders. So fingers crossed, we will now see a video about WaterAid's founding. And thanks, Fee, in advance for the technical help that you're providing in the background. My great privilege to be here with Grant Hill and Tony Kelly, the founders of WaterAid Australia. Grant, tell us how it all began. Well, Rosie, WaterAid began out of um, an existing campaign organised by Australian development organisations. There's about 30 to 40 organisations that came together in 2002 and 2003 um, to highlight the issues of um, dirty water and the lack of toilets causing disease and death. Uh, in countries all over the world and that we could make a difference. Out of that work, um, that's where WaterAid came from. And Tony, tell us, how did you get involved as a Managing Director of Yarra Valley Water? I got involved initially, Rosie, be, uh, through the promotional campaigns that Grant set up. People in the water industry have either got a strong social conscience or a green tinge um, and also intuitively understand the value of clean drinking water and effective sanitation. Tony, what's your long-term vision for water aid as we strive to 2030 and everyone everywhere getting access to safe water and sanitation? When I look back at my career, it's probably one of the things that gave me the greatest level of satisfaction. I know if I just stayed in my business and worked hard in my own business, Yarra Valley Water at the time, you know, I could have worked 24 hours a day and made that much difference. But if I put the same effort into something like water aid, you're literally saving lives. And that opportunity still exists for leaders in the water industry and I strongly encourage them to get involved for that very reason. We have created water aid in our region and we can strive to achieve our vision of everyone everywhere having access to safe water, decent toilets and hygiene by 2030. Thank you, Fee. Now, I hope that I'm coming through loud and clear for you. I've frozen on my screen, but I'm gonna cross my fingers and hope 
that I'm coming through and someone will let me know in the chat box if I'm not. So if you do have any questions about water aids history, if you are new to this journey, please do let us know in the chat box and I'll answer questions at the end. But let me tell you now more about water aids work and the broader work that we do that takes this simple story of those girls standing outside their school toilet and feeling so proud of their toilet. What I want to tell you about is these people that are on your screen here, this constellation of people, and I want to draw out for you the work that we do with them and the context that they work and the driving um, values that they have and how we work together. I also want to draw out for you water aids work alongside these people. What we do always varies depending on what's asked of us and what is needed. Some of the obvious things that we contribute uh, are funding and knowledge. They're probably the most obvious. What's less obvious is the work that our teams does in behind the scenes. So we've got a really strong, small Papua New Guinean team and they work as mentors. They do incredible analysis of the situation and what's needed to drive change. For example, a couple of years ago, our team was instrumental in the first ever national water and sanitation policy being inaugurated in Papua New Guinea. First ever national policy. Some of the incredible work our team does. But before I get into that, let me paint you a picture of the context that, our, that these people work in. So for me, the first word that comes into my mind when I think about Papua New Guinea, a country that I love, is diversity. There are over 832 languages, not dialects, languages in Papua New Guinea. There's a population of just under 8 million people and the majority of those people, 87% live in rural areas. And many of those areas are really inaccessible. There are very few paved roads in Papua New Guinea. I've heard areas of Papua New Guinea really accurately described as not even getting the shadow of government services reaching them. The rates of family and sexual violence in Papua New Guinea are horrendous. Most estimates have the stats that 70% uh, of women experience physical or sexual assault in their lifetime, 70%. There are 4.8 million people in Papua New Guinea that have no safe water. So unfortunately that makes Papua New Guinea one of only three countries in the world that has less than half of their population getting access to safe water. For every 10 people, only two in Papua New Guinea have access to a decent toilet. And as a result, it means 200 children die every year from diarrhea alone. And telling you those statistics and thinking about the work that's being done to address that to achieve universal access, on current rates, Papua New Guinea won't reach universal access to sanitation for centuries, for two centuries. That means it won't be you and I that celebrate achieving universal access. It'll be our children's 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 children or something. And that to me is not good enough. And that is what we are working with this team of people to change. I'd like to introduce you to Takali Raviri, and he's the head of program management, uh, the program management unit that sits within the Department of Planning, looking after water and sanitation. Takale's tall, strong frame respects his history with sprinting and athletics. He's an ex-champion Papua New Guinean sprinter. Now his passions are divided between wash, and athletics. Last time I was in Papua New Guinea, I bumped into him at the airport, welcoming home with such pride the Paralympic team that had been competing in the region. Takale has, I would suggest, one of the hardest planning jobs in the global water community. As I said, less than half the population has access to water. When you go into his office, it's piled high with files and pieces of paper. And I think 
somewhere in them is the information to tell him what assets are where, who put them there, what's working, what's not. But it's not a particularly strong starting point, yeah, to address that massive need that he has. And to fund the work, to close that gap, to Kale and his four people team need to unlock millions of dollars of funding. And there are international funding bodies that want to support Takale and to deliver this mission, but with each of them comes crippling bureaucracy that just puts uh, Takale and his team into a state of paralysis so often. Before COVID, the Papua New Guinean Public Service Administration was weak. Takale and his team weren't paid for months. So as I said, Takale has a pretty tough job. This here, sitting in this colourful small office, is Martin Mengu. He's the district administrator for the WeWAC district. So to get to WeWAC from Port Moresby, you fly over the Owen Stanley Ranges, the home of Kokoda Track. You also fly over the mighty Sipic and Bismarck rivers. Those extraordinary mountains, for me, really symbolise and serve as a, 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 a barrier, a literal one in terms of there are no roads that go from Port Moresby to East Sipic. Remember, outside of Port Moresby is where the majority of the population lives, but there are no roads connecting them. It also serves as a barrier in my mind of inequity where funding and resources aren't reaching the majority of the population and the services of basic health and education. So as the district administrator, he's the CEO for the district looking after the economy and health and well-being of the 100,000 or so population of the area. So when looking just at the WASH challenges that Martin presides over, 37% of people in this district have no safe water and 41% practice open defecation. In schools, 2%, 2% have hand washing facilities and only 31% have toilets. His responsibility is over the district programs and Martin has a vision for what's he, what he wants to achieve but for him, the power and the money still sits in Port Moresby. When I met him in early February, in February, not a single kina of his annual budget had arrived into their bank account to fund wages or any of the work in the district. So he has a plan, but to actually put that into action is a massive challenge. The next in the constellation of people uh, is Winnie Segu. So she's standing um, there, seated is Melissa from the Papua New Guinea Water Aid team. Winnie standing there, she's one of only two female environmental health officers for the entire province of East Sipic. She's um, got an impressive list of things that she does and things that she works on. So she is co-chairing the district wash coordination body that meets every quarter. She's facilitating the rollout of Healthy Islands program, which is a behaviour program on health and hygiene. She brings together really key province actors and communities to drive change for water and sanitation. Winnie doesn't focus on challenges. Her focus is on the challenges that other women face due to gender discrimination, those rates that I touched on before of family violence and the lack of women in leadership. In Papua New Guinea, there is not a single woman in parliament. Winnie is focused on leading change in her district and leading by examples. So she said, if women see other women taking the lead, then they will have the courage to speak. And let me tell you, Winnie has a lot of courage. This is Lucy Henson. Lucy is the Disability Inclusion Officer for the East Sipic Disabled People's Organization. Lucy is a powerful advocate for people with disabilities in the district, which is a tough job when you have zero resources 
and a membership that's made up of some of the poorest and most marginalised people in the district. She herself is vision impaired and uses a cane that you can see in her hand to get around, which is no small feat. Imagine navigating the myriad of physical obstacles she needs to to get around the chaotic informal settlement that she lives in. Worse though, for her is the stigma and discrimination that she and other disabled people face due to attitudes such as a belief that if you have a disability, you or someone in your family must have done something evil or that you are cursed. Lucy fights every day for the voices of people with disabilities to be in the decision-making process on any decision that affects their lives. She really lives the motto, nothing about us without us. So given those challenges and given the incredibly complex context that we're working in, what is it that Water Aid's work looks like? We've got a small team, as I said, of less than 20 Papua New Guineans that are supported by a team in Melbourne. Our team has a really diverse range of skills and are absolutely united by their commitment to our vision and our values. So alongside Takale, um, last year, our team launched the first national monitoring system with support from the EU and UNICEF. So the first time ever, Takale and his team will have the data to guide government planning, operations and maintenance and reporting on the sustainable development goals. Alongside Martin, with funding from the Australian government, the team did that baseline survey so that there is a district wash plan which sets out the vision for the district to become the first ever to be open defecation free. And in that photo there, you can see Takale proudly holding the district plan um, that we developed with Martin. And our team, sometimes it's this, the, the simple logistics supporting the team to make sure that someone from Takale's team could actually go to WeWAC and attend the wonderful launching ceremony of this plan so that they could celebrate their, their collective efforts. When COVID-19 struck Papua New Guinea, Melissa, who you can see seated from the Water Aid team, worked alongside Winnie to ensure that the behaviour change program that we were, they were rolling out across the province was able to be very quickly adapted to include COVID safe messaging. So it means over these last few months, they have reached hundreds and thousands of people with the important messages about information about COVID and the important messages around washing your hands. And they integrated information about family violence services as well as the rates have gone even higher. And alongside Lucy, Water Aid's provided some really important support, things like ensuring that she can get to key meetings and have transport, as well as an invitation to them. When that district plan was launched in Niwak, it was such a proud moment to see Lucy up on stage with all of the other dignitaries representing people with disabilities and their rights to water and sanitation. So that is the meta story, that bigger story that goes around the work that Water Aid does. And the work that we do is to ensure children, like the, the boy that you can see there and other children like Deslin and Sharon, two beautiful Papua New Guinean girls, any child of under five to not only make sure they reach their fifth birthday but that they actually get to go to school. And when they go there, they have clean water and decent toilets, just as every Papua New Guinean child should. And we can only do this with your support. And I'd like to thank you again for all of your support. There are such a different ways that you could get involved. Really appreciate the support and donations and in the chat box, you can click on the link to support the project. But there are lots of other ways that you can support as well. For example, we've just had one of our partners, Hark, work with Martin and his team to put a climate resilience lens on that district plan. 
So thank you in advance for supporting the work to get 12 schools access to water and sanitation and benefit 3,500 students uh, and teachers. And I hope that I've brought to life that meta story of all of the work that we do to, to make sure that those efforts reach eventually, we'll do some and influence the rest so that we reach all of Papua New Guinea. And it is us and not our children's children's children that are celebrating achieving that vision of universal access to water, sanitation and hygiene. So thank you very much for your support. And I've put a, the email address there of one of the team or myself that you can contact. Thank you so much, Rosie. Um, and I'd like to say, you know, on behalf of Vic Water, we really value our partnership with Water Aid. We're thrilled that you've come on board to this conference as our charity partner and absolutely encourage all of our um, conference delegates to get behind the PNG project using that link um, to uh, pledge some funds towards that project. And I think we have a target of $2,000, so let's hope we get there by the end of the conference. Thank you so much for joining us. And a little birdie tells me that today is your birthday, so happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> it's a small industry, Rosie. So, happy birthday, and thank you for your patience too in sticking through the uh, the technical issues that we had earlier. Not at all, a pleasure, and thank you for the birthday wishes. A great way to be here to celebrate. Thank you. Okay, everyone, we are now going to break for lunch. Um, and after lunch, we won't be coming back onto Webinar Jam. We will be running four streams concurrently uh, through the afternoon on Zoom webinar or Zoom. So you will need to use the links that you can access in your conference profile on the conference website. If you have any problems accessing the sessions this afternoon, please get in touch with us using our generic email address, vicwater at vicwater.org.au, as um, individual staff will be moderating those streams and we won't be able to respond to emails. So use our generic email and contact our office manager, Fiona Old, please. Okay, before I go, um, I'd also like to remind you that we will be having a social hour from five o'clock this afternoon after the end of the afternoon sessions. Um, and at this session, we will be drawing a raffle for Beyond Blue. So please remember to buy some raffle tickets before five o'clock. It closes off at five o'clock and we'll draw the raffle during the social hour. Um, you'll also have a chance to network with other delegates. We'll run some Zoom breakout rooms so you can meet some people maybe that you know or you haven't met yet. Um, and we'll also be watching the second half of the MD's video. So I hope we will see you all again at five o'clock and also look forward to seeing some of you uh, in the streams uh, that I'm running anyway this afternoon. So enjoy your lunch break and we'll see you again at 1.30. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.